Good evening, my dear friends in Christ. Good evening to you. I hope that and trust that uh, you are happy to be here in this God's temple. And this is place where we grow together and share our lives because we are belongs to a wider family. So that's a great privilege as Christian. We are not uh, tiny little individuals, but we are a great community in his presence as we come together, worship, to acknowledge that we are Christian. I think in my life that is something very, very special. I always overjoy and thank God that I am belongs to a great, a big family. Not that to my, uh, the, the, the worldly kind of a physical, biological family, but I am belongs to a, a spiritual family who always look after me and cares for me. So my dear friends, this evening I got a very interesting text. And it's a text that often we might have read and reflect upon, but still we believe the living word always gives a new message. That is why we say it is a living word. It is living word. Always renew and give something very special, a brand new thing. Every moment when we think about and reflect uh, on his scripture. So let us uh, see the words uh, of chapter 2. I know that you have your Bible with you. And in chapter 2, Acts of the Apostles, and uh, uh, verse 37, there it says, When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Brothers, what shall we do? Let us pray. Father Lord, your words gives us strength and courage to live in this world. We find our solace and our comfort and our confidence in this living words. There is no any other refuge in this world, Lord, other than your words. So as we come together, one family, to reflect upon your living words, Lord, grant your wisdom, your spiritual gifts, and your mysterious truth that will be revealed and divulged and open to us, Lord, that we will return with joy knowing that, that we have a living Savior and we have committed for that his life. That's a wonderful relationship which you have given to us. So as we unite in one spirit, Father Lord, grant your mercy that we will find your comfort, your eternal salvation through these words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What shall we do? When I was reading this text, uh, I don't know whether I have shared this story before. If I have shared in the morning, probably, the congregation, maybe not in the evening. If I have shared, I'm so sorry. Uh, you are going to get the, the double dose. Whatever it is, it happened about 20 years back. I'm, well, I was like 20 years younger than this. Uh, and I was serving in Nugegoda Church. That was early January, uh, mid-January, I would say maybe the end January, in 2005. All of a sudden, I got a call. I'm not married that time. I got a call from my president, Reverend Jebanison. Leslie, he calls me Leslie. Leslie, please, I'm going to send some books and some relief type of stuff that you have to take it to Tangol. It was around 5 o'clock. So I know... As you all know, the ministers are very much closer to the women than the male because MWF is the stronghold in the church life, I would, I would say often. So I rang my women fellowship, my members, my sisters, and I told that I have to go to Tangol. I have to take this stuff. And then they said, no, don't worry, Reverend, I'm, we are there for you. We will come, we will come. And within one hour time, I got five women and one gentleman. And I arranged the vehicle. And got the stuff, and we just set off from Ngegode to uh, Changol. That was around 8 o'clock in the night. While we were passing Paralia, all of a sudden, uh, slightly I saw it was utterly dark, really dark. And I saw that the, on my right hand side front wheel came out from the vehicle, and it just went before us and went into a, a drain near in that Paralia. It is 
close, you know that the place where the train uh, tragedy took place. So then we were, the vehicle was not balanced. It went like this and this and stopped near the, the, there's a, what you call this Patakeya uh, bush. Uh, so it was stopped there. Then all the women with gold jewelry and uh, and various other stuff in their hands, mobile, maybe not mobile phone that time, I don't know. So they had their purses and all that. Then I have to be responsible about these women. And uh, one vehicle came and told, I was in my castle, Father, don't stay here a long time. People are really crazy because you know what has happened about a month back here. And try to take them as possible, soon as possible, to some uh, place, safe place. So I was helpless. And with these women, five women and one gentleman, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, vehicle came from Colombo side and stopped and asked, Father, what can I do for you? I said, if you can, uh, just it happened. Then this lady started telling, what shall we do? What shall we do? We have come across a crisis situation, a problem. What shall we do? So this all of a sudden vehicle came and they took all the women to Gold Richmond Church. But uh, the story didn't stop there, my dear friends. I was sitting on the road, main road, in the middle of the road with gentlemen, and waiting what we can do. I never ever thought, my dear friends, this is a really a miracle. All of a sudden, a motorcycle came and stopped. There was a mechanic. There was some mechanic and he asked, Father, can we help you? It's a Satsgunan, Premani Satsgunan. It's a, it's a real story, a testimony. And he said, Father, I can take the nut and bolts from another garage. It's close by about, not close by Ambalangoda. So I will go there and bring the bolts and nuts and whatever the fix into this wheel and I will make it. So my dear friends, by two o'clock in the night, we were able to go to Changal. So my dear friends, what shall we do in a time like that? When we go back to the scripture, not to uh, uh, get on with this story, but it's all glory and thanks and praises to God the Father. But when we go come back to the scripture, after this uh, the astonishing kind of uh, strong sermon after they have heard from Peter these people felt and they were telling what uh, shall we do my dear friends if you go into the uh, book of Amos chapter 3 verse 8 if you go into book of Amos chapter 3 verse 8 there it says like this. It says, uh, chapter 4, verse 8. 3, verse 8. Yeah, there it says, The lion has roared, who will not fear? The sovereign Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy? And also if you go to Matthew chapter 11, verse 7. There it says like this. It says, Matthew, Matthew 7, Verse 11, there it says, uh, 17, sorry. There it says, uh, Matthew 11, verse 17. There it says, we played the pipe for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. My dear friends, there are people, when they hear the listen, the word of God, but they don't feel that they have to respond to that. They are insensitive to the word of God. Here Amos is telling that when God is rolling, people cannot be silent and they will start prophesizing. When you come into that spiritual level, when you tune yourself with the heart of God, you cannot be quiet. And that Jesus is telling that we sang this church, but you have not danced. And that's telling that again, when the word of 
God comes to you, it requires a response from your life, from my life, my dear friends. That is what happened. There, Peter is telling that you're the one who crucified this living Savior, the Lord and Messiah, both Lord and Messiah. When they heard it, they were really guilty. They were really felt sorry about what they have committed. And they have felt that they have a response and they should respond to his message. And Peter is stressing that you have killed Lord and Messiah. Lord and Messiah. Lord means one who owns our lives. Curious, master, owner, and Messiah. Christos anointed one. You have not done uh, merely that you have not uh, crucified a, a good moral teacher or maybe a, a kind of a community leader or a famous popular person in, the, uh, in Palestine. But you have crucified Lord and Messiah. That is something really uh, hitting our hearts and asking that you are responsible for this. So they felt that they experienced the presence of God and they wanted to respond to that. It says they were cut to the heart, pierced their hearts, pricked in their hearts, stricken their hearts, very upset and deeply troubled. Various versions bring various kind of words to explain their feelings, their experience, what they had. Why? My dear friends, the great, uh, the, 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 uh, the message is when his words come to the world, it will not uh, return in empty. Well, uh, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, it says like this. So, it's my word that goes out from my mouth it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So my dear friends, we have great hope in that his word, that it will never return empty way. So today, we are reflecting that the living word, we are reflecting upon this life-changing world, because we see this Peter is the one who is preaching. Preacher has, uh, Peter had uh, a life-transformed experience. His entire life was changed. And people saw how he has got this spirit, how he has got the strength to speak like this. One who has uh, uh, betrayed, one who has uh, said that uh, uh, I do not know, and he declined. But here now, He's telling that you are the one who crucified my Lord and my Messiah. So my dear friends, today we have to acknowledge this word is coming to us with powerful way and expecting a response from us. This word is not only 2,000 years back someone has written. Today in this context, in this moment, it expects and speaks to us and requires a response from you and me. We all are sinners. We all have our weaknesses. We all have our fragile nature that we carry with us. But in this moment, God is telling that uh, my grace is sufficient for you. Always, Peter, when he preached, he stressed the law. John Wesley is advising, without law, you cannot freely preach grace only. Avoid preaching grace without law. Make the whole contents of Paul the whole Christ. Preach the full scope of salvation. That is the advice of John Wesley. We cannot take out the law and judgment when we preach because we are responsible about our actions. We are responsible about our failures because our God is going to judge us. It is not merely that we can always tell your sins are forgiven, the grace is sufficient, and we are going the same merry-go-round. 
But there should be a turning point uh, that uh, we have to change and we have to make our decisions in relation to the response of the gospel message. Because God, the word has power. The word has power to create. The word has power to revive. The word has power to purify. The word has power to reveal the truth. And his word has the power to save you and me. On that basis, on that ground and faith, we can submit ourselves to this word. We can encounter ourselves with this word. Where are we today? If you want to know that his grace and his love, we have to give our location to him. If you are using Google Drive, Google Map or whatever it is, you have to give your location, present location. Then it will give the directions to the, your destination. The problem is that we don't give the location where are we today. We try to hide ourselves. We, have to, we try to cheat God. We try to escape ourselves from his presence because we have that guilty feeling. No, my dear brother and sister, even myself, that his grace is always sufficient for us, that we can place ourselves wherever we are living, whatever the condition we are going through, he is prepared to accept as we are. That is the love of Christ. That is the miraculous love of Christ, my dear friends. Then we see in verse 38, there it says, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Repent. Repent. Metanoia. Taking a U-turn, my dear friends. Taking a, a U-turn. It is something like this, if I would say. If my wife is going away from me, I will just cry. Nadi, where are you going? Why are you leaving me? I cannot live without you. Please turn. Come back to me. I feel so sorry and I am really nothing without you. My dear friends, this is how God is calling us. When we are going away from his presence, when we are going or in our own directions, in our lives. God is waiting and calling you and asking, Prasanna, come back. I'm waiting you for you. Dana, come back. You cannot go away from my presence. Where are you going to hide yourselves? I'm waiting till you return. So my dear friends, that emotion, that feeling, that experience, we should feel whenever we go out from his presence, whenever we betray his love in our lives. Because this God is a loving God. This God is coming, searching you and me, my dear friends. So we see that metanoia, repent, it is not mere you are saying sorry. But metanoia means you have to make a decision. Yes, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm not going to put myself into that uh, space of temptation, the room of temptation. I know my weakness that I'm not going to put into test with that. We have to make our decisions, my dear friends. It is not just coming and kneeling and asking sorry from God, but it is something more than that, a definite decision that we may have to make. And my dear friends, the other thing, and be baptized. And Peter is telling, you have to repent and you have to be baptized. Baptizo is to dip or immerse. With baptism, what we do, what is the meaning of that? It shows that, uh, that we publicly proclaim and acknowledge he is my savior. When we baptize the family, the infant, even the entire family, profess and acknowledge him publicly, there is no any other savior, there is no any other Lord in my life. He is Jesus Christ is my savior. I acknowledge and I profess 
and I keep in, try, in that trust. And also baptism is, my dear friends, that uh, acknowledging his saving power in personal lives, in our, in our personal lives. His grace, his mercy is sufficient to redeem myself, whatever the sins that I have committed, whatever the things that I may carry with me, evil things, his grace will purify me. My dear friends, recently I had a... Uh, then the second point is forgiveness of your sin. Forgiveness of your sin. So my dear friends, uh, in uh, John West, uh, Charles Wesley's uh, beautiful hymn, that is, And Can It Be That I Should Again? There in the verse 4 it says, uh, it says like this, My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Verse 5 it says, No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine, alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. So my dear friends, the second thing Peter is insisting that uh, your sins are forgiven, that receive the forgiveness of your sin. So my dear friends, recently I had a chance to visit a cancer patient. She's not a Christian, but I went with some of our church people, uh, two or three, and I have been visited earlier also, that lady, but this time when I went, uh, uh, she's in a really uh, kind of a, uh, deteriorating her health, and maybe last stages, who knows, but somehow she's in terrible pain. Then when I went and talked to her, she's in Casbah, a bit a long way to go, and I just, explain the message of gospel. And I said that, uh, that there is no any faith that you can be in bondage. You, are be, you have that freedom. You are being free through grace of God. And there is a living God. So my dear friends, when after I came home and I prayed with her and gave the message gospel and uh, I said uh, that whatever happens, that we have a living friend in our lives, living savior in our lives. So in the night, I got a SMS. And that SMS says uh, in singular, Father, mata kata kalata passe, mage hita hariyata konsa sani pauna, mage mata loku shakti akava, mata bala purtu, mata jivite bala purtu akava. I got a different hope to live in this world. So, my dear friends, there are many people who are going through in the same experience. They know they do not have that encounter. There are people who are being thirst to know that love, to know that their sins are forgiven. They are not carrying that karma vipaka in their lives. So, my dear friends, this is the time. Can we share that? Can we tell others? That is a, a great uh, good uh, news, my dear friends. So that is why John Wesley said, all need to be saved. All can be saved. All can know they are saved. All can be saved to the utmost. This is John Wesley's telling. All can be saved. There is no any person in this world cannot be saved through his grace. Your sin cannot uh, spoil the communion cup, my dear friends, because his love is bigger than my sin. His grace is bigger than my sin. Only requirement is repent and believe he is my savior, my dear friends. And then Peter is telling, Ecclesia, the re receive the gift of Holy Spirit. You know, my dear friends, this happened on the Pentecost day, the harvest festival of Jewish tradition. When they were celebrating the harvest festival in the Jerusalem temple, Ecclesia means that uh, call out, called out, they are out of Jerusalem city. 
uh, courtyard, Jerusalem temple courtyard. They were close to the temple mount where the, the David's uh, body was buried. If you read uh, 1 Kings chapter 2 verse 10 or Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 29, that says, here is the David's body is being buried. It couldn't be in the temple court. It's outside. So when the temple inside the harvest festival is celebrating, there is another harvest is gathering on the other side, my dear friends. There's another harvest, harvest of soul is gathering. 3,000 people are being saved and acknowledged Jesus as the Savior. It's a, such a wonderful message, my dear friends. Here material thing, here physical thing that they are collecting. But on the other side, outside Ecclesia, called out of the city, and they are gathering there is a great revival. There's a great harvest gathering for building the kingdom of God, professing He as the Messiah. So, my dear friends, we are part and partial of that uh, same tradition in that big family. Then we see the, what are the new features of the formed, the newly formed Christian community. I'm not going to go in that. But that is something we always study. And we know the main four pillars. Perseverance in apostolic teaching, fellowship among believers, breaking bread of bread, and united in prayer, my dear friends. These are the main four qualities from the earlier church. What do you expect from your church? Do you expect a nice, glamorous kind of a musical instrument? What do you expect? Or nice, smart, faster? Or do you expect in your church uh, uh, maybe some other sound setup or AC? What do we expect from our church? Yesterday I went to Borupana, Ratmalana. There are about 2,500, 3,000 people are living in that same area. And I visited some houses, and one house I went, it's size of this much, only this much, this portion. And that, she's a Christian and living in that house, but she had such a joy in when I went and prayed with her. And cooking there, sleeping there, sitting there, washing, and all that within that day, about this much of room. But she had a joy. But we expect sometimes we have to do may AC, or we may not expect various other things. Do we expect, my dear friends, uh, the teaching, the fellowship, and breaking of bread united in prayer? Our main features should be not that how much we are having instruments here and how are the performance, but our accountability towards His message. Whether do we have enough teaching in our my church? I'm so happy that we have got 14 Bible study groups. But still, we need more. I like if we can have something in this uh, Bishop College, that area. I like one if you can have one in Moratu and Ratmalana. I like one if you can have in Nugegod and Omagama, that uh, Maharagama site. So, my dear friends, this is what God is asking us. Do we have sufficient teaching? If we can teach our people, that is the most important thing in the church growth. Because they know how to handle their Christian life and the rest. So, may the good Lord bless us and use us more and more.